so nervous. <laughs> Hot mic. <laughs> words that we said yeah sounds good okay so what is Fro Florida friendly landscaping so it's a science-based approach to maintaining an attractive diverse and more sustainable landscape and its goals are to conserve water and also to protect water quality <coughs> So we're going to run this video. Oh, yeah, I didn't check this out. Hopefully it works. Um, it has a narration. Since the main goal with Florida Friendly Landscaping is water centric, um, how much water exactly do we have to work with? So this video is going to illustrate that. Oops. Going to. Okay, there's no sound on it. It's fresh water. 0.6% is the amount of water that's not tied up in the polar ice caps or in glaciers. 0.003% is the amount of water that is truly available. Water that is not polluted or trapped deep underground in the soil. This final amount is what has to be shared by every person on Earth so there you go. We don't have a lot of water. And, and if you're wondering what the big blue bottle was because we didn't have sound, that's all the water on the earth. Glaciers and underwater and oceans. salt water. Right, salt water. So that is what? Fresh water? Fresh water that's, that could be frozen, it could mm -hmm. be hidden under the ground. And this is, yeah, no, but, yeah, the point zero zero three is what we have to work with. That's drinkable water that we have access to. And the point six might be the polluted, yeah, non drinkable. And science has figured out that we use 60% of that available water to water our landscapes. So we're not even drinking it, we're putting it on our yards. So that's, that's something to think about, right? So some of the history is um, this program in the early 90s, they were doing tests with the water up in Tampa Bay and it was pretty polluted. They had a lot of nutrients up there. So the scientists thought, well, maybe it's the farmers, you know, they're putting too much fertilizer on their crops. Well, come to find out they, um, pinpointed the source of it and it was homeowners putting too much fertilizer on their landscape. So this program was started to educate homeowners on proper usage of fertilization and how to maintain and take care of their landscapes. So um, this is a program from the University of Florida and it's science-based so all the information that we get regarding this program is science-based. And I just kind of added this in today. This was um, appeared yesterday in the paper, Cape Coral Water Crisis. So very timely. Um, I guess the wells are running out. And the problem with depletion of wells is that we're on a, like, like a limestone bed. So if we take all the water out of it, it starts, it will collapse. So we need to avoid that problem at all costs because once it starts collapsing or filling in with um, saltwater intrusion, then we're done. So it's, it's pre a pretty critical problem. So hey, what's underneath Florida is sort of like a hard sponge. And you know, if you take the, take the water out of the hard sponge, then pretty, or a, a soft sponge, then it just starts to collapse. So we have to think about that when we're taking that 0.03% or whatever that number was out of that sponge. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program was deemed so effective that it was implemented into Florida legislation. So how many times do you get politicians to agree on anything? So this is no small feat, in my opinion. So this is a really good thing. So the highlight of it is um, it 
um, quality landscapes that conserve water, protect the environment, are adaptable to local conditions, and are drought tolerant. And homeowners associations and local government ordinances may not prohibit any property owner from implementing Florida-friendly landscaping. However, it does not invalidate an HOA or the local code restrictions. So you're still mandated to work. If you have an HOA, you have to work with them regarding your landscaping plan. So whatever they require, if they need a blueprint or they need a plant list of what you have in mind, you have to present that and get all of that still approved. Um, so it's, it's better to get the approval than to try to fight them later on down the, the road. And the, I, I believe the law says that they can't entirely prevent you from having Florida friendly plants. Now they might say you can't have those Florida friendly plants in your front yard. You have to keep them in your backyard. But you do have the option under this law to have Florida friendly plants, even if your HOA or wherever mm -hmm. community says, oh, you have to have these certain plants that we're all going to have. Well, and other members that I've talked to, they have successfully lobbied to get plants included on a list because a lot of times the homeowners association really isn't aware. They just go by a landscaper's list. So if you can give a good reason why a certain plant should be on the list, they'll more than likely include it. Um, other elements too that they might not like would be say rain barrels. You could put it in the back of your house, things like that, that they don't want on the curb. But those, those are all real specifics of HOAs and your own community regulations. Um, here's the list of the nine principles. And you all received books, and these principles are outlined in depth. And this is a, just an intro class, so we're going to spend maybe an hour on this. But we have had classes on each one of these principles lasting an hour. So. Um, if you want more information, just look in your book and you can Yeah, you don't have to memorize these. They're in the book. The books. I actually, don't. you have two books. <laughs> and those principles are in both of those books. And then you have a lot of other interesting stuff, too. Correct. <clears throat> so the environmental concern with the water is, especially around here, um, most of our storm drains, they go directly into a water body. So whether you live on the water or not, whatever you put on your landscape is going to end up in a water body. So you have to be um, kind of vigilant about what goes on there. Oh, yeah, here's another video that's going to kind of bring that home. The it's okay. not it's trash, oil, cigarette butts, and that way flowing untreated through our waterways. And that's not good for any of us, because we all live downstream. Clean water, it means quality of lives. So there you go. If we could see all that stuff and it was rubber duckies, you would really be amazed, right? So um, there's economic concerns with water quality. Um, tourism is the number one industry in Florida. And just think about why you moved here. Um, water is probably a big part of it. I know for my family it was. We like boating, we like swimming, you know, going to the beach, all of that. So um, water quality has a direct effect on tourism dollars and our livelihood. So the health concerns. Uh, I'm going to turn this one over to Marie. She is, a, she is a nurse, and so she's dealt with public health and can address some of these concerns that um, some that bad water can do. <laughs> How many people heard last year, the last couple of years about uh, green algae blooms or red tide? Or okay, very educated neighborhood out here. So what happens when you have a green algae bloom? There were people who lived near those out on the water. They had to leave their homes and go somewhere else because the toxins coming off the green algae were affecting them, making them sick. And actually, it, it, they're considered neurotoxins. They'll go right up to your brain, and they, so they are bad for your organs and for your brain. And red tide also, people couldn't go to the beach because there was red tide. 
and they would start to feel sick after a while. Well, it was a good thing if they left the beach because that stuff really does make you sick. So we're trying, what we want to do is we want to keep the water clean so that we don't get sick. Uh, actually, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, we've had the same issue with green algae where dogs would drink the water and then maybe die. So uh, drinking, swallowing, breathing, the air around bad water is bad for people, plants, you know, and, and the, everybody probably heard about all the um, sea life that was washing up on the shores. Like Sanibel people were really unhappy because there were dead fish all over their beaches. Well, that's all because the water is bad. And so we want to keep the water better by following these nine principles. I like what Marie said, by drinking and breathing. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we have to do, right? Right. Yeah, we have to drink and breathe. Um, so the impact of landscaping here. Uh, like we said, about 60% of our drinkable water is used on our landscape. So we have to be really aware of how much we're using. Unfortunately, in Cape Coral, it's a flat rate for irrigation water. So it's not really an incentive to conserve. So, um, but we know what we're putting on. And like Marie and I, we don't have turf. We don't have even an irrigation system. We just go out and hand water when our, our yard needs it. So we feel like we're doing our part um, to do that, so, yeah. Is anybody, how many people are in wells here? Okay. A lot of people. So that's what the newspaper article was talking about. It was talking about the fact that uh, people's wells are starting to have trouble getting water out, and the water is starting to be salty when it comes out because, remember that sponge, you start, the wells are pulling the water out of the aquifer that's underneath. And the aquifer isn't getting refilled fast enough, so then the wells are starting to deplete the aquifer. So they're talking about now maybe speeding up the process of hooking people up to the uh, municipal water system so that they can start drawing water up from, I don't know where they get it, I guess not the aquifer. But Another this, aquifer. <laughs> yeah, the, a different aquifer, I guess. But anyway, that's what that's about. Yeah. So that, that one picture there on the side, um, that's a picture of a Cape Coral Canal. And so what happens is the, the nutrients from the fertilizer, it gets down into the, into the canal waters and it feeds that blue-green algae. So that's, that's the problem with fertilizer and that's why we have the ban. So, um, but it, and then of course um, it's complicated too with the Lake Okeechobee releases and that sends down a lot of nutrients. So it's kind of a double whammy as mm -hmm. far as that goes. Um, and they are starting to do releases because the lake is so full. Right, because we got all that rain for this winter. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when that happened, what was it? A couple of years ago, maybe I 10 years so. ago. Yeah, and um, we had a, a bad summer that summer. Yeah, it was yeah. We first we had the blue green algae and the red tide, and then we had the hurricanes. Yay! <laughs> Welcome to paradise. So, so uh, principle number one is right plant, right place, and I think it's number one for a reason. If you get this principle right, everything else kind of falls in line. Um, right plant, right place is sort of self-descriptive. You got to get a plant in the sun where it needs sun, shade if it's a shade plant, all of that. Figure out what the height is gonna be. That plant was planted in the wrong place, as you can see, because it's coming through somebody's pool cage. Yeah, and that's funny. I mean, it, it's probably been that way for a while. <laughs> so they just liked it that way. I don't know, they didn't wanna get rid of the plant. Who knows, anyway. Um, so one of the other principles, or the sub, a sub principle of right plant, right place, is you want to remove prohibited and invasive species from your landscape. So what are those? You've probably all seen um, the Australian pine that was brought over to hold the beaches. Well, it's turned into an invasive. All of these plants were brought over for a specific purpose. Well, they have no natural predators. So they, they run rampant and they overgrow and they take over natural sites. So the carrot wood is another really good example. I know in Cape Coral, all the contractors put carrot wood trees in the yards because it's really fast growing 
like a weed tree almost. And But the problem is it has all these berries on it. So the birds eat the berries, and then they take those berries and they fly out into islands, you know, offshore, and then they propagate all out in this or your neighbor's yard. Or the neighbor's yard, everywhere. And then into the wild and scenic areas, they just take over. So it's become a real problem. And then, of course, they now they grow up, they grow into power lines. So LCEC has spent millions and millions of dollars to trim back those. Um, Brazilian pepper is another one. So these are just the really prominent ones, but this is by no means a conclusive list. Um, so you want to make sure, and there's, <clears throat> there's a site, oh, it's right on here. The assessments, the IFAS assessments, if you're wondering if a plant is a bad guy or not, you can Google this site. Um, put the plant name in there and it'll tell you the, the worst one is an invasive and then it has like a high risk and then there's a caution. So it'll give you all that information and you can remove it from your landscape. So once you remove it from your landscape, you're going to, you can plant something Florida friendly. Am, am I correct in thinking this is probably on the list of the sheet back there that has websites? Kathy? Oh. Yeah, Don, Don put together okay. a list of websites. So this websites is on the too, website so. list that you could pick up there in the back. Right. And you all are welcome to take pictures or, you know, um, if you want to access it that way. So if you want to install Florida-friendly plants, um, you have your plant book now, which is a really great resource. You can keep that in your car when you go to a nursery because the nursery plants, the pots don't always have all the concise information on it that you need. Um, it might say what the plant is, and that's about it. So your book that you've received will tell you how much sun it needs, how much water, what kind of... Um, Should we talk about this? Oh, yeah, let me... I think it's on the next slide. Okay. There we go. Okay. okay, so this book right here is my favorite thing. <laughs> All right, it's the Plant Selection Landscape Design Book. And inside it, this is a picture of one of the pages, are sections. Large trees, small trees, large bushes, lar small shrubs, and ground covers, palms, perennials. They're all in here. And they're by section, so you don't have to memorize this. And when you, you know, you're going to the store, you're looking for something, or you're looking for an idea. All right, so you open up your book. And in this book, there are every page all these different plants, as you can see there. And over here on this, um, let's see, you can't see it. But over here on the side, it tells you what all these rows are. Like the first row is the scientific name. I, I'm too old to learn those, so I have not. The next <laughs> row is whether it's a native or not. OK, so this is a native. And then the next row is uh, it grows in, let's see. Where all those oh, it's fast growing. Uh, it, these are the sizes it grows to, so you don't want the thing that's going to be so big that it gets, goes through your pool cage. Oh, 30 feet. You probably don't want one of those. Want one of those underneath something like a power line. What kind of water it needs? Oh, this will tolerate uh, some dry or wet, and this or it likes wet. Mm. Uh, it likes a lot of sun or some sun. It has the Attracts name Swamp in it, Marie. Hmm? It has the name Swamp in it. So oh, it only oh, likes it a lot of water. Swamp, so that's a hint. <laughs> and then it says what it does. So those are all, every one of these plants in this book has this information. So you don't have to memorize these, these things when you go to the plant store or when you're planting your yard. Look in the section that you're interested in. Oh, large trees. No, I don't want a large tree. I want a small tree. Okay, I'm going to go to, oh, medium trees and pick something out and then go and look at it in the, in the plant store. Well, and you might be surprised too because some of the shrubs uh, turn into trees, as you may have known if you lived here for any number yes. of years. Um, or some of the trees will turn tree. into shrubs. There we, you had, go. we had hedges along both sides of our yard planted by the nursery before I really knew what I was doing. And, and so some of them wanted to be trees. And so I let them grow up into be trees. And then he said, no. So I chopped them off. Then I thought, oh, maybe I'll let that um, silver button would be a tree after all. And then it'll make more space for these other things. So I've been amazed at how forgiving uh, native plants in Florida really are. So you can sort of be creative with whether you want to be have a shrub 
or a tree, you can buy the same thing. On that note, maybe we could do one of the giveaways, right? Yeah, talking about plants. <laughs> Talking too much. Nope, you're good. Okay. Yep. No, this is perfect. Oh, tell them that this is online too. Oh. Oh yeah, and this is online too, and that website is on that sheet. Our first winner is Barbara Stepien. All right. See, it pays to be almost in the front row. Yay! <laughs> All right. The first plant. Yay. <laughs> and you can see too, it tells you what they attract, butterflies and birds um, also, which is kind of a fun thing. So, all right, so also in the right plant, right place, um, you wanna choose a diversity of plants. Monocultures uh, tend to be a little boring and a lawn is considered a monoculture or a, this hedge area. And the problem with monocultures too, other than being boring, is that if they get infested with a bug or a disease, it tends to race through that particular plant. So if you plant intermittently, you can still have a hedge, but you know, maybe have two, at least two varieties and maybe even three so that you kind of break that up. It gives it a stop gap so that this bug or virus or disease will will stop on the one plant. So that's the advantage of that. Plus, you know, the picture, it, the diversity one looks so much better, right? Which one would you choose? You'd rather have a little more variety in your landscape if you have the choice to do that. Uh, scientists are figuring out now that plants can talk to each other. I can't remember all the words, but underground, the, somehow they send messages along to other plants that are like them especially if it's a mother plant, will send out messages to protect the baby plants. So if you have a, one kind of plant and something's attacking it and she's putting up her defenses, then she'll tell the other plants underground there are like that to get ready. So if there's something in between that's not getting attacked, then that other plant has time to get ready. All right, yeah. So... Considering the mature size, this, this is what you really have to look at. It always breaks my heart to see these tortured plants. Um, we have a master gardener that used to work for LCEC, and she said, you know, when they send the trucks out, they're not arborists. They don't care about the plant. They care about the power line. So they're going to cut it in a V or an L. That's basically their directive. So they do not care about the health of the plant. They just got to keep it off the lines. So this, this Bismarcky over here, this was in my neighborhood on a walk. I don't think that was the look that the homeowner was going for, but that's what they got because they planted it too close to the power line. So, so when, you're, when you're deciding on a tree, look up, look sideways, and then pick one that fits in that space. Look up is a good one, yeah. Yeah, yeah look up. Um, this tree eventually declined. They had It was removed um, last year, so, you know unfortunately. And then planting turf. Um, if you think about why you have turf, and some homeowners, they, they have pets. Their pets prefer turf. They want to have a spot for the kids or the um, pets to play in. So just think about why you have turf. Um, if you can use an alternative, such as a ground cover, especially in shady areas, um, it would be better to do that because it requires less water, and we'll get into that a little further down the road. And there's a section in here of ground covers. So here's a couple of um, before and afters on how these people got rid of some of their turf. We, we do um, encourage with Florida-friendly landscaping to use as little turf as possible because turf uses so much more water. It's like three times more water than a planting bed. So it's, you're not only saving water, 
Um, you might have a more beautiful landscape if you decide to do it that way. Um, this, these people just put in a pathway, it kind of draws you back in. Um, it's pretty lovely. Here's another example. I like this one a little better. Little Those are the same flowers. place, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so that just shows you what you can do, um, especially putting a little path in and drawing people into your landscape. And then you can have different planting beds and color and a, a good variety of plants. And that other book that you got that has similar look is a book about how to make a landscape. So it helps you figure out how to do the, be the after picture. Okay, as you can see, um, we keep revisiting the theme of 60% of our water goes to irrigation. So you'll know that number by the time you leave here. And you can tell all your friends and neighbors. <laughs> um, so efficient watering is principle number two. So we're going to try to get into that. So to water efficiently, um, you want to do it in the morning. Of course, you probably don't have a choice. If you're on um, the watering schedule, they tell you what time you have to water. So it's out of your hands as far as that goes. Um, if you have a choice, you would water in the morning and only when your lawn needs it. When a lawn needs watering, typically the leaves start to fold in because they're trying to conserve water. So only water uh, at that point. And if you have a, a irrigation system, make sure you check it at least once a year. I've been told twice a year is optimal because we have a lot of particles in the water. So you have to, if you have a filter, that's even better. You have to change that, look at it. Um, just make sure it's working properly like anything. When it works properly, it does a better job. And if you're trying to figure out whether the water is getting where it needs to be and if enough is getting over to where it needs to be, you can take tuna cans or some little thing like that and put it in various parts of your yard. And then after your uh, sprinkler system has been on for a while, you can check and see, oh, that one's empty. Okay, I have to change the, the direction on my sprinkler or that one was full halfway through. So that's a way of checking how much is getting where. Mm -hmm. And I think in the handbook, um, under this principle, it will outline how to test your irrigation system the way that Marie said with cans and things. So you can actually do that little test on your own. And of course, in the cooler weather like now, it doesn't need to be watered quite as much. And when it rains five inches, it doesn't need to be watered either. <laughs> Not... And I, th I believe most irrigation systems, especially the newer ones that are installed, are required to have a rain sensor. So you have to make sure that's working as well because they also poop out after a while. Um, so here's, here's a comparison. A thousand square feet of grass, turf, requires 22,000 gallons of water as opposed to a plant bed, which is only seven. So that roughly translate, translates into like Two, swimming, two large swimming pools of water for the turf versus less than one for a plant bed. So it's something to think about, and you're really saving on water that way when you start replacing your turf. And if you do over water, I'm sure everyone's seen uh, the dollar weed in their yard um, in certain areas. That just means you have too much water. So but it also encourages uh, weed growth and it will flood out the oxygen. So it's just encourages fungus and bacteria. It's all bad things over watering, unless you have a water garden or a rain garden. So fertilizing appropriately. Um, you can get your soil tested at Terry Park um, just to Basically, they only do the pH level. Is that correct, Don? Yes, pH. Um, if you want anything more specific, I believe you have to do a mail-away test, which would cost a few dollars. I think the U does it for somewhere between $20 and $30, where they'll really analyze it for you with specifics. Um, suffice to say that around here, things are pretty alkaline. They're usually around 7.6 to 8. So if you have anything that requires an acid, soil, you're going to have to add acid fertilizers, or I would encourage you to put it in a pot where you can really control the soils. So just think about what you plant. But 
we're very alkaline here. So, and that is one of the things that you'll find in piece of information in the book. So these are just a few tips. If you do, if you fertilize on your own, um, if you spill it, sweep it up, don't leave it on the driveway because then it will wash down and add nutrients to the water body. Um, yeah, never, never fertilize before heavy rain. So if you look, it's, I have a, um, a dripper for some potted plants and that dripper is really smart. If we're going to get rain, it's tied into the weather system. So if we're forecast to have rain, it'll say it's put itself on a rain delay. So it, it will just shut itself off, which is pretty cool. It's called beehive, which I really love. Um, this is a, a bag of fertilizer. So the, the numbers, um, yeah, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And we basically live on top of a phosphorus mine. So we shouldn't be adding any phosphorus to our landscape. Um, and that's also prohibited during the right. fertilizer ban, right? So, and nitrogen for sure. And um, palms need to be fertilized four times a year. Normally, uh, I learned after I planted foxtail palms that they require it five times a year. They are the most needy palms, just FYI on that. So, um, and you need a specific palm fertilizer because that will have micronutrients in it. And that's what they need to keep them from getting all manner of palm ailments. So make sure you fertilize your palms and with a palm fertilizer. And that palm fertilizer is okay for pretty much everything in your yard. Mm -hmm. I just buy a big bag of palm fertilizer <laughs> and then I do the palms and then I chicken feed other things. But don't think that what you need for your grass is what the palms want. Correct. Yeah, the, the grass, the turf fertilizer is a little harsh and it could burn other things. So you probably want to refrain from putting turf fertilizer on ornamentals or on palms. Oh yeah, no, um, no weed and feed just because it's, it's, uh, you're, you're broadcasting too many chemicals onto your property. You should do one or the other each at a different time. And even spot treat. If you're doing, if you have weeds, you don't need to put weed killer on your whole landscape. Um, it's kind of a waste. And don't use a whole bag just because you have it. You know, the, um, the fertilizer companies, they tell you how much to put on there and just read the directions. Um, they want to sell you fertilizer. So if they said use a whole bag, they would, but they don't. They tell you specific amounts. So you have to figure that out. And we talked about the ban um, from June through September. So basically hurricane season, you're not supposed to, and it's our rainy season. So you're not supposed to use nitrogen or phosphorus. And um, if you hire someone, hire only, um, it's called best management practices, trained professionals. They have to go through the extension class where they are certified. So they actually have to pay some money and um, there should be a BMP certified person on every crew that's applying fertilizers or pesticides or herbicides to a landscape. So as a homeowner, you should be able to ask your service, you know, do they have this certificate? And ask them also what they're putting on your yard, get a schedule. It, it never hurts to um, figure out and ask them what they're doing. They should be able to give you, I just turn this off. I don't know. They should be able to give you a sheet and material safety data sheet on anything they're putting on your yard. MSDS. I learned that from my husband at, at his job. <laughs> there you go. And over fertilizing. Yeah, you can all manner of things. The, the worst part of it is the runoff into water bodies. So it's adding nutrients that we really don't want or need. So principle number four is mulch. Um, not very sexy, but it, it can be quite magical. So um, let's see, it buffers soil temperature and it also maintains soil mo moisture, reduces weeds, and um, it kind of gives you this nice overall 
uh, homogeneous look to your landscape. These are some types of mulch. Um, we typically recommend flora mulch, which is made from the Malaleuca trees that were brought over to dry up the swamps back in the 30s and 40s, I think. And so they turned into a huge invasive problem. So these trees are harvested, uh, cut down, mulched up, and sterilized. So they will not put any bad things in your yard. They're also, they don't float away from what I understand, and they're a little more termite resistant. You want to, yeah. So you can see here, not recommended inorganic, and you've got the rocks right there. But actually, right by your house, a foot and a half or two feet away from your house, it's good to have the inorganic ones because that helps keep rodents and bugs and fire away from your house. And then starting out there, wherever you have plant beds, then have the organic mulch that not only keeps the weeds down and makes everything look nice, but it also decays and adds to your, to your soil. Right. Rocks are not recommended for around plants because they heat up a lot and they could damage plant roots. And especially in the summer down here around palms, you typically see the rocks around palms. It's not the best thing for palms and could potentially stress them out. So we recommend organic mulch. Rocks, like Marie said, is good for around a foundation. It helps mitigate bugs and rodents and things like that. Or a path. We have shell paths in our yard, but stone paths are fine too. So if you want to make a path, then you can use an inorganic. The shells are nice because they kind of pack down. They're a little more stable than mm -hmm. uh, like a river rock or something, you know. If you, um, so how much mulch do you put in? Well, about three to four inches deep, and you don't want to mound it like on that picture over there. That is... Yeah. <laughs> Not so, volcano mulching. Somebody told me, well, they just put it there because they were getting ready to spread it out. So yeah. that's the excuse. Um, what, what happens here? The rodents can go right in and eat your tree. <laughs> yeah, they're living right there next to your tree. Then you start chewing. So you don't want it. You want to have a space around the trunk, a couple inch space. And then you want to have the mulch out to the drip edge because that's, out to the drip edge, which is straight down from the edge of the leaves, is all the places that your plant is getting that needs to be protected. And those outer edges are where the little tiny roots are that are probably going to be soaking up the water and need extra protection. So this is a really good example of how mulch make does make a difference. All of these shrubs were planted at the same time, and this was around a commercial facility. So all of these plants were mulched at the beginning, but the smaller ones by this drainage uh, area, the mulch kept going down the drain. So they stopped mulching it. So you can see where they didn't thrive, uh, they're stunted, and they were just left bare. But the other ones developed nicely and just are growing fine. So it's a dramatic example of how much of a difference mulch actually makes. So now we're on to attract what you want to do another another drawing. Okay. I did want to mention about the mulch that if you're interested in a floor mulch because it's got a few different mulches in it, it's readily available Yes. And Home Depot and yeah. if you go to Lowe's, <laughs> we're close to Lowe's. So if and you go, go to mulch. Lowe's hmm? go mulch. On, and go yeah. mulch, yeah. If you go if you go to a big box store at least, and you want to get two hundred bags, which we have done, or fifty bags or whatever, then you say, Can you have a guy go get that, that stuff and put it in your car? <laughs> <laughs> Marie's all about that. <laughs> yes. I say, Oh no, Joe, don't you go to the store because I'll expect you to do it. I'll go do that because yeah. oh, yes. I'll help the old lady. <laughs> Maureen. And these are all for Danny Yates. Danny Yates. Okay. Nice. Yeah. 
Okay, principal. All right, thanks. Principle number five is attracting wildlife. So why do you want to attract wildlife to your yard? Well, um, does there's anybody a... like birds? <laughs> Butterflies? All right. <laughs> They're wildlife. Yeah. So the important thing to do for that is plant as many native plants as you can find because over the eons, the plants and the pollinators and birds, they've all evolved together. So especially like a butterfly, they may have only one plant that can support them. And if that plant doesn't exist, there are none of those butterflies. So it's important to plant what is native to the area, along with other plants that provide food and pollen and uh, support to the, to the local wildlife. And in the book, you'll see, oh, but birds like that plant and birds and butterflies like that plant. So you can look at those things. And then there are specific plants. Each butterfly has a host plant. That's what it needs to, for a place to lay the eggs and for the caterpillars to grow. Yeah, they can I get think... nectar from other things maybe, but they need to have their host plant. So it's good to know, you know, if you want this kind of butterfly, what do you need? You need milkweed for monarchs, right? And, there, and so it works the same for lots of butterflies. Right. So. Um, yeah, what Marie said about this, the different plants, if you've only got a limited amount of real estate, uh, one of my favorite trees is the firebush because it provides the flowers. It blooms almost all year round. The birds love it. It creates habitat for them. It produces these flowers, and it also produces berries. So the birds love that. Marie has a really lovely spot on her patio where the birds come, they sit, they chirp, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's great, so. We sit in the lanai and we just can sit there and watch the birds and the butterflies right outside the screen. The mosquitoes can't get in and we still can see nature. <laughs> and so the, so the basics of creating this habitat is they need everything that we need, food, water, shelter, and a little space to fly around in. So you want to provide um, a variety of plants and layer your vegetation. And a water source is nice. Um, birds like the sound of running water. So if you have a fountain that creates the sound, you'll get a lot of visitors to your garden. If you can't do running water, just a, a pan of water is fine. They'll find that too. Um, and leaving snags where they can nest and feel safe. And then also the main one is eliminating insecticide use in your yard. You don't want to be killing off. You don't want to be the person who says, I can't get any butterflies. I just have all these caterpillars that are eating all my plants. Okay, well, that, guess what? The butterfly lays the eggs, the eggs hatch, the eggs hatch into caterpillars, the caterpillars turn into butterflies. So she was killing her butterflies before they got to be butterflies. Right. Didn't quite, didn't quite connect that circle of life there. So, but you know, that's why we have classes, why yeah. people learn. Right. She's learning. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And she was interested <laughs> enough to ask the question. So that's a good thing. So, um, <clears throat> and you want to, <clears throat> excuse me, can you talk about this? Right. <clears throat> Losing my voice. Oh yeah. Providing so. the, instead of feeding them. Oh, you I want to do a good I job have bird that. feeders in Minneapolis and I want to put bird feeders up in our yard in Cape Coral. And then our yard was getting checked out to be certified as a Florida friendly yard. And the master gardeners who came to look at it said, oh, you shouldn't have bird feeders. And I said, well, why? I need bird feeders. They said, you should have plants instead. Bird feeders are like having the birds go to McDonald's. <laughs> plants are what the birds are used to eating and the butterflies are used to eating over thousands of years. So we have plants instead. Mm -hmm. And we still have birds and butterflies. <clears throat> yeah, so that's, that's really important. And also the thing about plants is they come into production at the time when that wildlife species needs it. So if you're artificially feeding them, they're getting uh, like McDonald's, just whenever yeah. they want it. Oh, and so, they're getting out of sync it's with not, it's not healthy. The, the rhythm of Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so number six, principle number six is managing your landscape pests. So this would be um, if you have the, fir the first rule is don't expect a perfect yard. You know, we live in Florida, there's going to be bugs and you might see a chew mark or something on one of your leaves. Don't panic, don't get out the pesticide and spray everything. Um, just be a little more forgiving and actually about 99% of the bugs in your landscape are beneficial. So, and the birds will eat a lot of the rest of them. Mm -hmm. The birds or feed them to their babies and each other. There are predator bugs that will feed off other bugs. So sometimes if you just give nature a chance, it will resolve itself. The problem will take care of itself. Um, I know one of my um, particular bugs is the Sri Lankan weevil that seems to get into my landscape. So uh, I sort of just hold a can or some like a little water bucket underneath and because they like to tuck under the leaves and then they drop down. So if you can catch them that way in the soapy water, whatever, if you do, you do the least invasive, like if you go to a doctor, you know, if you say, oh, my back hurts. Well, you're not going to go right into surgery, are you? You know, you want to say maybe do a chiropractor, a massage, something first that's easy and then see how you feel and all that. So you do the least invasive thing first. You don't go right for the, the big guns like the pesticides. So it, one of the things that frequently eats plants are these Sri Lankan weevils that, that Vanessa was just talking about. They're little white, mm -hmm. uh, not bugs. Crunchy. Yeah, little like white hard beetle. shelled things, beetles. Mm -hmm. They're little white beetles. And if you if you look, look at your, you know something's eating it, you kind of shake your tree and little white beetles fall out. And you put a cloth underneath your tree, shake it real hard, pick up the beetles and remove them, maybe to the garbage can. <laughs> All right. So what we call this, it's a fancy word for picking off the bugs, is integrated pest management. So yeah, oh, yeah you, that's what we just did. <laughs> that's right. So yeah, you do the least invasive thing first, and then you slowly but surely work your way up. So you might want to try um, soap, you know, uh, horticulture soap or oil, and then work your way up. And you only want to use blasting with the hose. Yeah, blast blasting with the hose actually works mm -hmm. really good. Um, I got rid of white fly that way, uh, and I didn't need any chemicals. It was awesome. And then here's a, a picture of the lady beetles um, eating aphids. So yeah, so you know, it, it's, it works. Um, oh, this is, the, this is the oleander caterpillar. That's one of our things is avoid plants that have a bug named after them. So I don't know, just, just a thought. Um, but I, I, my dad was up at Gulf Coast Village and they had like a whole bank of oleander. And I came back one day and they were completely defoliated, but you could see all the caterpillars on there. So they had buffet time, yeah. So And that caterpillar actually looked very much like a caterpillar for a native- um, A fritillary. A gull fritillary. So yeah, I don't know how you tell the difference, but I guess there is a difference. <laughs> If it's on the oleander, it's probably the oleander yeah. caterpillar, yeah. <laughs> so. so here's, this is like the food pyramid only for chemicals, for pesticides. So, you know, you save the sugar for the top. You don't want to use very much of that, if at all. And so, you know, start with the least invasive and work your way up. Because side means kill. And it doesn't, it doesn't uh, delineate as to what it's going to kill. It's going to kill everything that it touches. So you just have to be really careful. And another thing in this handy book is susceptible to diseases or susceptible to pests. Mm -hmm. And so maybe don't buy those plants. Right, right. So number seven is recycling yard waste. And you, if you can do this, this is a really good thing. Um, Marie and I both do this. I have a, a big oak tree in my yard, so it, right now it's dropping leaves. So I take those leaves and I use it for mulch. So it's great. And um, yeah, tell me about your mulch. We just, we just trimmed bushes the other day. 
shrubs. They were my husband amazingly agreed to trim the hedge on on the side of the neighbors that I like to talk to low enough so I could see her on the other side of the hedge. And they were way up there, and now they're down here. So we have all these cuttings. So all the little ones I just kicked under the hedge because there's instant mulch, and the big ones. My husband got to, the big, bigger branches, my husband got to chop up with the mulching machine that he bought on eBay last year. It's his, his favorite thing. Yeah. So then he made real mulch that he spread around in other places. Yeah, that's so gratifying because I, I have one too. He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, very cool. And it's amazing. A giant, giant pile of branches, it only makes like that much mulch. <laughs> so. Which which leads you to believe too, you know, when you buy the, that bag of mulch, that's a lot of trees. So just something to think about. That's where my brain goes. So you're helping the environment by buying flora mulch because right. they have to chop up a lot of trees to get that. Big it's a win-win, right? Because mm -hmm. they're already nasty bad guys. So yeah, they get rid and of if that. You're, if you're at the store and you can't remember what was the kind of flora mulch that we were recommended to get. Flora mulch for Florida. Yeah, I, sh I should put a picture of that in here next time. Yeah. Um, and also recycling yard waste. Um, if you have a, a composter for your kitchen vegetables, that's a good way to do it too. You could put um, a little bit of yard waste in there and that will turn into some soil for you. And leave grass clippings on the lawn. So they, they will turn into some uh, fertilizer for you, some mulch, and um, decompose. We don't, don't want to put any clippings um, because it adds nitrogen. Again, it, everything ends up in the water, so you want to be really careful what you do with that. So number eight is reducing stormwater runoff. And um, let's see here. That basically stormwater runoff is excess water from irrigation, rain, other sources that goes off into the street. It starts collecting pollutants and nutrients, and then it goes down the storm drain. And in Cape Coral, that goes right into a water body. So nothing's getting filtered. So one of the directives of Florida Friendly Landscaping is you want to keep as much of that rainwater, stormwater on your landscape so that it filters down and then it gets into the aquifer that way without carrying all those pollutants from the street down into the water body. Uh, so we have a yard that it has no lawn. That's what we decided. Then we don't have to have a lawnmower and we don't have to hire somebody. So we have this no lawn yard and we had mulch all over the place. And one of our next, our next door neighbors said, oh yeah, I love sitting out, out front when it rains and just watching your mulch go down the street because it was going down the swale with the rainwater. So we put some big clumping grasses at the end of our yard and so the mulch does not leave our yard now. And you can do the same thing. If you live on a canal or something, you can have plants that will stop nutrients, mulch or grass or whatever, from going into the water by just stopping the flow of the water and, and filtering it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the banner at the bottom, only rain down the drain is a good motto. So, and we all live on a watershed, basically. Eventually that water from our landscape goes down and hits the nearest water body. So to reduce stormwater runoff, um, it's a good idea. Pavers are great. Um, they are a porous surface as opposed to a concrete driveway. Um, we put in, our house uh, had a concrete driveway. It was all cracked and old. So just for aesthetic reasons, we put pavers in. Well, we used to get a lake after a rainstorm that was about six feet wide. Now we don't get that anymore because the water works its way down from the house. By the time it gets out to the street, there's no more water left. It's gone down in between the pavers. So that's, that's a, a really nice thing. Um, you can put in a rain garden if you have a low-lying area in your property where it tends to collect water. Um, we just did a house that um, they have a lot of water because their neighbor is rebuilding or building. 
so they're getting a ton of water. So hopefully they're going to plant a rain garden there to sort of soak up some of that um, excess moisture. Of course, does, there's, does anybody here have problems with one part of their yard being really wet? Yeah, so that's something. Look in here and either find plants that like to be have wet feet, like to grow in wet places. So you look, yeah, likes wet on the descriptions. Or actually make an area that it is a place where you can collect the water by having plants that sometimes they're in water and sometimes they can tolerate the drier part. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's different too about Florida, up north people would put their downspouts on their driveways because they didn't want the water directed to their basements or near their house. So down here, you want to keep that water on your landscape. So one way to do that is to, this one, this picture here has it like a little rock island, which is directing it. Again, you use porous material. So you can turn that into a rain garden right by your downspout, or you can just put it on an area that you don't want to walk in because it could get a little soggy and wet, but you don't want it directly onto your driveway because then again, it's going to take that water, go down your driveway, start um, sweeping all those nutrients and pollutants down with it and then right into the water body. Yeah. Well, if it's, you know, it's probably not right in the middle of the driveway. It's probably over in the side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you can change the direction yeah. by having li just different little, um, what would it be called? The spell. Elbows yeah. and stuff. They point it in another direction. So right at the bottom, you can change the direction of the downspouts over to somewhere where that you wouldn't the water to go. But that's okay. Yeah. So that's a good thing to talk to those builders about. We would love it if builders would take this class, <laughs> but they don't always. You can you can edge, if they're still around. Oh, they're building the neighbor's house. Maybe you can talk to them. And there is they, there is a. Um, Extension does cater to builders. They can take, um, get help and get certified um, for Florida friendly landscaping as well. So it's, it's problematic. Um, you could also put a rain barrel under that spout so that it would just catch it right there. And then the overflow valve, you could take a hose and then direct it to wherever you want. So it's not, it's not flooding that area right there at that, part, at that point. Oh, I thought we had one. I guess we don't. Maybe there's a picture later. Um, so yeah, reducing runoff. Uh, as you can see, this irrigation system is also watering the street. So that's not optimal. Make sure your watering heads are staying on your landscape. Oh, here we go. This is at the um, Cape Coral Historical Museum. So they have uh, several rain barrels on that property. So this one over here, they've got the rain barrel and the, the overflow is plumbed down and it goes under the, under the walkway into this other rain garden area. And this was taken when it was raining. So the water is collecting in this rock area. So there's the barrel up there at the top and it goes underneath and then it comes out here. Because you can't see those yeah. blue arrows very well. So none of that water goes out into the parking lot or the street or any other area. It just stays right on that property, which is amazing. So it's doing its job. Yeah. And that water, typically for, the, for this rain garden, it will stay there for a few hours after the rain has subsided. And then it just filters right down into the property. Okay, I think we're going to do one another drawing. Mm -hmm. All right, Steve and Leanne West. All right. 
All right, All right. we've had row two, Congratulations, row three, and row four. Steve and Ann West. <laughs> I didn't win. <laughs> you just didn't win a Danny Yates certificate. That's <laughs> but you know a person. <laughs> Well, congratulations. That'll be fun to buy a new plant. So we're on the last principle here, number nine, protecting the waterfront. So whether you live on a waterfront or not, you're still responsible for what goes in that water. So just be ever mindful about what you put on your landscape and you'll be fine. So protecting the waterfront, the main thing to do is if you do live on a waterfront, you want to establish this buffer zone. Think officially in Cape Coral, it's 10 feet. So no mowing, no fertilizer, no pesticides, no herbicides in that area. So you have to use plants that are adapted to that. So native plants typically are good. Um, turf would be not, not optimal because it needs fertilizer all the time. It needs to be mowed, all of those things. So. If you have a choice, it would be good to use uh, alternative plants. So here are your plants all, all the way back 10 feet, well then farther too, but not turf grass. And they're all native plants. The, what, the advantage, I don't know if we've talked about this. Native plants are native. That means they've been around for a long time uh, before Europeans got here and they're adapted to this climate. So they're used to really wet seasons and they're used to really dry seasons and they're used to heat. And a lot of them, are, most of them are used to a little bit cooler, but not too cool. So that's why they're really good for around here because you don't need as much water when it's dry and you don't need as, and they can take the heat. So you don't, they're use native plants, save, save water, save your pocketbook. Right. Yeah, once they're established, they usually don't need any um, additional fertilizing. Um, some of them also function just fine on available moisture, rain. They're adapted to the climate and the, the zone. So the low maintenance zone, like Marie was talking about, is 10 feet. If you can plant a border, now some people have retention ponds. Um, it's nice to plant. It's called a, a literal zone and these plants are adapted to the um, fluctuating water levels and they also filter out nutrients and maintain a healthy shoreline for the water area. So see right along here, so they have, here's turf grass that has to be mowed, fertilized probably, and watered maybe. But around here then, closer to the water, are the plants that will get the nutrients and filter them out and keep them out of the water. So here's the, uh, a re rehash of the nine principles. And hopefully you maybe can implement one thing that you've learned here today to um, get started on with your own landscape. And is it worth it, landscaping? Um, it's been found that a landscaped house has between 15 and 20% of the property value when you sell it. So that's all things being equal. The landscape adds a lot to the value of a house. So this picture were some alternative ideas that were developed for um, a, an HOA community and so which house would you rather have? Would you rather have one that has no landscaping or maybe a little landscaping or landscaped all the way out to the, the road except for the, the 10 foot, you know, the easement area. So that's all up to you. You know, you can, it's your property. You can do what you want. So that's all the same house, but the look really changes depending upon what you do. And you don't have to do it all at once. The other thing is, a tree trust organization says that one mature tree provides as much cooling as 25 room sized air conditioners. So if you have a tree or two or three in your yard, 
you'll have a cooler yard. You'll go to, go to the store and come back and go, oh, it's really nice here. And if you have a tree near on uh, shading your air conditioner, then your air conditioner will be uh, working more efficiently and be, will be cheaper to run. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, now that you guys have already taken this FYN class, you are eligible for a landscape consultation. So we have a team of landscape consultants that will come to your property and it takes about an hour. We tour your property, we address your specific concerns, and then we do a write-up report so that you have something to go forward with. If you're wondering, where do I go from here? Or if you have other questions and you need some guidance, we'd be happy to help you with that. And it's a $25 fee for an individual home. We also do uh, condo communities, HOAs, larger areas, and those are 50. So if you're interested, Don and, and um, Jan back there who signed you in, just let them know and they'll indicate that you would be interested in a consultation and I can send you the links and some more information on that and we'd be happy to proceed and help you with your landscaping goals. One person said to us recently, oh yeah, how about this plant? My husband hates it, but and we said, oh, that one of the master gardeners who was with us said, oh, that's a really valuable plant oh, and it looks really healthy. And she said, could you put that in the report so I can show my <laughs> husband? <laughs> yeah, I had the same problem with my husband because he wanted to get rid of a live oak tree when we bought our house. It was short and scruffy and things were growing out from the bottom. So it looked more like a shrub than a tree. So he says, oh, let's just get rid of that. And I said, no, we can't. I said, it's a native tree. It's a native oak tree. I said, it's going to be great. So he trimmed it up and now it's like 30 feet tall. It's beautiful. Um, and there's so many birds in it. And, you know, it's just creates a lot of shade. Like Marie said, it's, it's so cool out there because it creates an enormous amount of shade. So it was well worth keeping, which I would encourage. Um, oh, so I don't know how this slide jumped in here. I think we found this. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but anyway, so the, this is sort of along the lines of um, bringing you all into the 21st century because lawns are, were from the 17th century where, you know, you had these stately manors and people the wanted people to show did. The rich people did. They wanted to show off their mansions. Mm -hmm. So, and they had time and money to hire groundskeepers, you know, before there was mechanized mowers and all that, or they have, would have sheep or goats, whatever, to eat, eat the vegetation and play games. They played games on the lawn. That, that was the, the main reason why they had lawns. So the lawns became a status symbol. So when people came to the U.S., they wanted to bring the, the rich people wanted to bring those lawns with them. So that's how they got moved over. So and then in the 18, I think it was 1860s, the push mower was invented. So guess what? Everybody wanted a lawn. And they could have a lawn because they could take care of it, even if it was a little patch of lawn. On so, average now, I don't know who did this survey or how, but people on average spend more time mowing their lawn than going on vacation. I've read that too. Yes. So, so, so thank you all for coming. And here's just 